This video was made possible by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream with the link in the description. These are pollen particles suspended in water as seen under a microscope. Notice how they jiggle around. In fact, they never stop jiggling. Why? The answer to this question helped prove the existence of atoms, figure out the movement of stars, and predict the rise and fall of the stock market. Hi there, welcome to Up and Atom. I'm Jade. So, how could something that we see under a microscope help us understand gigantic stars way out in the universe? Or even stranger, a totally man made system like the stock market? Well, the story begins in 1827, when Robert Brown was hired by the British Museum to help form their new botany department. One of his interests was how pollen could be used to classify plants. One day, Brown wanted to look at some pollen under the microscope, so he put a drop of water on a microscope slide and added pollen to it. Like always, the pollen wiggled and vibrated in the water, but for the first time, Brown wondered, why? He got swept away in this question and totally forgot about his task of classifying plants. Let's see if we can figure it out. When we watch the pollen for a while, the small vibrating movements seem to add up, causing it to drift and zigzag through the water. What is a typical phenomenon that may cause something in water to move around? Well, one I'm sure you're familiar with is a current. Brown thought maybe the surrounding air was causing a current which was moving the pollen. A pretty good guess, but there's a problem. A current would push all the pollen in one direction and the pollen is moving randomly. So that's not it. Brown's next thought was maybe it has something to do with water evaporation. To test this, he needed a way to see what would happen if evaporation stopped. So he suspended a drop of water with pollen particles in it inside oil, keeping the water trapped. But the jiggling was still there, so water evaporation was out. Brown knew the plant the pollen came from was alive, so he wondered if perhaps the pollen might also be alive and actively swimming around like sperm. This might sound silly to us now, but what would you think if you put something under the microscope and it never stopped jiggling and moving around? I would definitely think something spooky was going on. But when we repeat this experiment with things we're sure are definitely not alive, the jiggling is still there. It's not just limited to pollen. So that wasn't it either. The defining feature that all of the jiggling specimens have in common is that the motion is totally random. Eventually, Brown moved on to other experiments without solving the problem. He was probably having a tough time convincing his colleagues in the botany department that looking at a piece of pollen under a microscope was really the best use of his time. But we are not going to give up. Now before we go on, let's get a little context for some of the scientific views at the time. Atoms had not yet been discovered and the popular understanding of liquids and gases was that they were densely packed with particles and surrounded by an invisible substance called caloric fluid. Scientists thought that when they warmed up a liquid or compressed a gas, that caloric fluid was flowing into the system. Then when they let it cool, the caloric fluid would flow out. But some scientists were working on a different idea, which said that all those changes in pressure and temperature could be accounted for by one simple thing, a small amount of particles constantly moving and bouncing around. Now, from the perspective at the time, this was a pretty strange idea. How could a relatively small number of particles fill up a whole space the way a gas expands to fill up a container? And how do they keep moving even after being left alone for a long time? Shouldn't they just quickly settle down and lose all their energy, the way you see a cloud of dust settle? But there was an even bigger problem. The theory said that the particles were so small that even the best microscopes at the time wouldn't be able to see them. How was one supposed to experimentally prove a theory that couldn't be seen? Well, it was Einstein who came up with a solution to the problem, and in doing so, solved Brown's pollen mystery as well. 
He figured that even if you couldn't see the tiny particles themselves, you should be able to describe how they interact with something larger that you can see. Like wind. We can't see it, but we know it's there because we can see its effect on other things. This is my mum, and she's going to help demonstrate this idea. Here we have an amp connected to an electric bass guitar. Here I'm putting in some polystyrene balls, which represent water molecules, and a giant red ball, which represents the pollen particle. When we put the amp on a low setting and play the guitar, it'll vibrate, causing the balls to bounce and jiggle around. Look familiar? Now let's turn it up. This represents an increase in heat. Hit it, Mum! The more energy put into the system, the more violently the balls jiggle around. So if these tiny particles, or atoms, did exist, it would not only explain how increases in temperature affect pressure and density in liquids and gases, it would also explain why Brown's pollen never stopped jiggling around. Thanks, Mum! This was Einstein's idea. A nice theory, but how do we know it's true? Well, let's try it with some water and something else that we can see. Ink. Here I have a glass of cold water and a glass of hot water. If water really is made up of tiny atoms which vibrate faster if more heat is applied, how do you expect that the ink molecules will behave in each glass? Take a moment here to pause the video and see if you can guess how a drop of ink will behave in each glass. Ready? How did you go? There's a massive difference. The ink molecules disperse much faster and much more violently in the hot water. This is exactly what we should expect based on Einstein's theory, as the hot water molecules are vibrating faster and more energetically than the cold water molecules. This theory was experimentally proven by a French physicist named Jean Perrin, who won a Nobel Prize for his work. Not only did this debunk caloric theory, but is considered the major turning point for atomic theory, where even the scientists who were most skeptical of this constantly moving tiny particle idea were converted. This laid the basis for everything we now know about atoms. Lots of modern technology, from the device you're watching this on to nuclear power, were made possible by these fundamental insights into the microscopic world. So big thanks to Robert Brown for getting obsessed with jiggling pollen when he should have been classifying plants. Because of his pioneering work, this phenomenon of tiny atoms pushing around a larger particle is called Brownian motion. Brownian motion is most famous for its role in proving atomic theory, but it's turned out to be useful in many other fields, including astrophysics and finance. Now, this might seem weird, because how could the random motion of pollen being hit by millions of water molecules possibly apply to giant stars and man-made financial systems? Well, what is Brownian motion really describing? Behind the pollen and the atoms, it's one big thing being affected by lots and lots of smaller, random forces. So let's imagine that our grain of pollen is in fact a giant star. What in the universe might surround it that could make it jostle around like the water molecules? As it turns out, the combination of lots of little pulls from the gravitational fields of smaller stars can jostle around a type of large star called a massive binary. A star might not be literally hit by thousands of smaller objects from all sides, but there are still many smaller, random forces being applied to a larger object. The force is just gravitational rather than being physically hit. Just like with the water molecules, the smaller stars are not coordinated with each other, so the forces they exert on the massive binary add up to random motion. What about for financial markets? This is probably even weirder because pollen jostle and star pulling, although massively different in scale, are naturally physical phenomena. 
The stock market is a purely human enterprise. What forces could possibly act on the price of a stock? Well, imagine there are 10 apples available to buy. The price of those apples will be much higher if 10,000 people want to buy an apple than if just one person wants to buy an apple. That seems pretty straightforward, but what determines how many apples are available or how many apples people want? The number of available apples could rise if the weather is good for apple growing or fall if there is a pest invasion. Those things aren't easy to predict and can be considered random factors for all intents and purposes. That was a very simple example, but in real financial markets, supply and demand depends on lots of different things, including a plethora of human emotions, greed and fear, hope and defeat, elation and despair, news and sentiment, the state of the world, and many more. Forces on the stock market are more abstract than water molecules and gravitational pull, but the mathematics of Brownian motion can still be applied. It's still a lot of smaller random forces acting on a larger object. Brownian motion isn't about pollen, stars, or the stock market. The power of science lies in its ability to pull out all of the abstract elements that different phenomena have in common and using the solution to one problem to solve many. You know, if the same mathematics can be used to solve many different phenomena, this leads to a very interesting question. Is the universe mathematical, or is math a language we've invented to describe it? Is math invented or discovered? I've made a video discussing these very questions over on Nebula, which you can watch for free with this link. So Nebula is an educational streaming platform made by your favourite educational creators like Adam Neely, 12 Tone, Real Engineering, Wendover Productions, Braincraft and many more. We created Nebula so we could have more creative freedom to bring our creations to life. For example, I felt that this question of is math invented or discovered needed more than a month of work to do it justice, which is about what I spend on my regular YouTube videos. Because of Nebula, I was able to spend four months researching the topic and get help in the production process to really make it a special experience for you guys. If you like the video, consider subscribing to Nebula to get access to and support the creation of more videos just like it. It's only $3 a month, but our friends at Curiosity Stream are offering a special deal where if you sign up with them, you get Nebula for free. Curiosity Stream is a documentary streaming service with names like David Attenborough and Stephen Hawking. So by signing up with them, you're getting two educational streaming services for the price of one. That is literally hundreds of hours of awesome things to learn for less than $20 a year. If that sounds like something you're interested in, go to curiositystream.com slash upandatom. You can find that link and the link to the Is Math Discovered or Invented video in the description. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!